91. It's April the 4th, 1983. For those of you who are not aware of it or didn't get the beginning of the program, I'm starting a talk show. I've done it for two weeks this evening and several weeks ago, doing a talk show on this program for one half hour before World Watchers begins. You can call in, ask questions about local news or items that I've carried on the program in the past week or the weeks before. Many people call the house and want information about the broadcast. And uh, this way, instead of answering you one-to-one, we can share these answers on the air. So we did one half hour this evening, and we'll be doing that from now on. From 7.30 to 8, I'll take calls on the air, give you a chance to talk and share some of the things you're feeling, and then begin the regular program from 8 to 9. This is the 15th anniversary of the death of Martin Luther King, Reverend Martin Luther King. Uh, My philosophy is that the way to remember somebody is to find out who in the heck killed them and quit covering up the crime. And that goes for Mrs. King or Jesse Jackson or all the hypocrites in the world, whoever it is. When you have the information, share it. If you don't have it, go for it. A man was slain. He had a dream. His dream was one of nonviolence, and just like Gandhi with his nonviolence, he was murdered. And I have spent a lot of time investigating the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy and any of these other murders, even the shooting of Ronald Reagan and the Pope John Paul II or the murder of John Paul I and Nelson Rockefeller. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. If they were murdered and the murders go free and if the murders work for the federal government, we're all the losers because there was a reason to kill these people to get them out of the way to go on to kill more people. These are the death squads that are working and uh, Reverend Martin Luther King's death was a conspiracy. As a matter of fact, the House Select Committee on Assassinations did an investigation on John Kennedy and Martin Luther King came out after they spent $6 million with the conclusion that there was a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King, closed the doors, locked up material, and I haven't heard, maybe I'm wrong, correct me, send me the article, call me, what black man, what white, has said, well, let's go on, except for the team of researchers who've wanted to know who killed him. Where are the black leaders, just as you may have been reading the paper this week about the Jews who helped Claus Barbie, the Jewish traitors. Yes, there's Jewish traders and there's black traders and there's Chinese traders and so forth. But the problem is that we all sync with them and we should know who killed this man. So they come to the conclusion there was a conspiracy and then they leave it at that and want to get on with business. If you wonder why a great greater percentage of blacks don't have jobs and won't be able to afford housing and there's no plans for their futures, Uh, Just figure out what happened to the black leaders, Malcolm X and Whitney Young and Martin Luther King, and maybe you can be able to figure out that there's no one left to speak for them, and the so-called black leaders now are absolutely zero in terms of doing anything except for their own sake. I have one article here from December 28, 1974. Dr. King's killer sues Tennessee. That's James Earl Ray sued the state of Tennessee because he said he gave to Percy Foreman, his CIA attorney, the names of two Louisiana men, one from Baton Rouge, and one was worked with the Teamsters. The other worked with a Mideast organization, and he said they were involved in killing Martin Luther King, and he wanted these men investigated. One was a man named Z.T. Osborne from Nashville, an attorney, and of course, by the time he sued, this was in 1974, Osborne was dead. There's so many primary witnesses that die. And he said one was an agent of the Mideast Oriented Organization. Now, I've done many broadcasts of Robert Byron Watson and how he discussed the Middle East organization that was involved and bragged about killing Martin Luther King two weeks before they murdered him, coming out of Atlanta, Georgia. And as a matter of fact, Larry McDonald, the congressman, the representative from Georgia, was just named as a co-heir to the structure of the John Birch Society uh, just two weeks ago. In the tape, on the tape I did on John Lennon's murder, referring to Mark David Chapman, that was December the 20th, 1980, that was two and a half years ago, I talked about Tony Adams and Beirut, Lebanon, and the Center for Assassinations involved with the John Lennon murder and the Martin Luther King murder involving George Habash, the CIA assassination teams linked to Chile, to the murder of Allende, to the murder of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. 
This was broadcast number 471, if you want to look that up, and referred to the Lebanese headquarters. In 1974, earlier, James Earl Ray had referred to the Middle East Organization, and later I tied it into the Mark David Chapman, John Lennon murder. The assassination teams are actually a few in number that always hit the same bases, and if we solved any one of these murders carefully, we would find who is doing all of them. Also, along the lines of uh, anniversary of Martin Luther King's murder, one other article from the Nashville, Tennessee newspaper, November the 2nd, 1980. James Earl Ray names four others in a scheme to murder Martin Luther King. And they were all involved in international smuggling and drug smuggling. And the international fascist organization is a combine of assassinations, weapon sales, and narcotic struggling. Now, James Earl Ray mentioned three people. There's four in the article, but one of them is particularly important. He mentions Carlos Hernandez, who he knew in Memphis, and later this man was arrested in Mobile, Alabama, on a narcotic offense. He mentioned David Graveyard, G-R-A-I-V-E-R, Graver, and as being with him, knowing about his contacts in Laredo, Mexico, and this graver later was charged and indicted for embezzlement from the American Bank and Trust Company of New York City, and he worked with the present Secretary of Commerce. That was when this first came out, this story, November the 2nd, 1980. He worked with this person from the Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Philip Kuznick, K-I-U-T-Z-N-I-K, who had contacts directly to Meyer Lansky, and then... There was a Randolph Irwin Rosenson, R-O-S-E-N-S-O-N. Now, Penn Jones Jr. in his continuing inquiry, his newsletter, had this printed, these names of these particular people. And Rosenson had a name in his car that James Earl Ray, he had a lift with him. There was a name in the car on a card, and the name written on the back of that card was Clyde Watts. Now, that is very important because Clyde Watts worked with General Walker in uh, Texas and had a part in the murder of John Kennedy, this team, and worked with Richard Morris in Texas who formed Young American for Freedom and he was an attorney for the uh, uh, the committee to investigate the anti-communists up in Washington. Robert Morris was the chairman of the House Un-American Activity. I believe he's now president of university in Texas, this attorney. But Clyde Watts and Edwin Walker, General Walker, uh, worked with Jack Ruby and worked with also this Colonel Willoughby that I've been talking about. And I think I've made a connection. I was talking to Peter Dale Scott this morning. He wrote a book on the war conspiracy and the Dallas conspiracy. And I think what I'm going to find in Dallas, Texas, and I've been charting it out, is the links of the same Nazis from the staff of General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines to Fritz Kramer and the German Fritz Kramer. I think there is a connection here. And the important thing is that the name Clyde Watts was associated with Rosenson at James Earl Ray. So once again, the assassination team, the names are overlapping, and I'll outline that more on the uh, Martin Luther King story. Uh, these people go back to the Hungarian freedom fighters, to the Ukrainian army, to the Radio Free Europe in Munich and the World Anti-Communist League that we were talking about before this one program started on the talk show, the World Anti-Communist Congress for Freedom and Liberation. And Peter Scott has a Fritz Kramer, spelt with a C, but he was from the Abwehr in Europe, A-B-W-E-H-R, Hitler's Army Intelligence. And I'll be outlining for you the role of Robert Morris, the American Security Council, the Young Americans for Freedom, but again, they think they tie right into James Earl Ray and the murder of Martin Luther King. And again, that ties into the Lebanon, Chile assassination teams that did John Lennon in. Incidentally, not this week. Next week, I'm going to continue with Strom Thurmond, Edwin Wilson, and Frank Turbell and the role of Strom Thurmond with the International Fascista Organization, again, going back to the John Lennon murder, but there were so many news stories I wanted to catch update this week that I'll do that next week, some more on Strom Thurmond. I did want to tell you, I re mentioned on the air, but I didn't have the, the price of the bail. 
George Corkala, K-O-R-K-A-L-A, is now in New York City. His bail was set at 450000 grand for his arms sale out of New York City. He's been convicted. Edwin Wilson is in jail. Corkala is in jail. Frank Turple is over in Lebanon. Corkala is one of the most important ingredients of this uh, story that I've been trying to get out to you on these death squads around the world. Uh, Turple and Wilson, their names have been in the news more, but Corkala did security for Scotland Yard. Corkala was selling security to Exxon. He was the one buying the silencers from Mitchell Werbel and is linked to the death, the actual death weapons and the sales with Samuel Cummings, all three of them up in London, headquarters in Monte Carlo, the arms merchant of the world, and Cummings' uh, sister is married to Senator John Tower of the Foreign Relations Committee. For some reason or other, the good Lord is with us. These people are getting locked up, and as they get locked up, they're offering to squeal. And I'll tell you a little bit about Wilson, what Wilson's telling in a few minutes. Now, there's a long article in the New York Times by Jeff Gerth, and anything you read by Jeff Gerth or Seymour Hirsch, read it over and over. And I'm going to mention it to you. I'm not going to share much on it except to refer to it, but I want you to be able to get it and copy it in the library if you didn't already because it was February the 8th, just a month ago, 1983, called, the title is European Linked to Illegal Acts Shielded by the CIA. And his name is Alfred J. Bueller, B-U-H-L-E-R. Now, I'm convinced, just as I did those broadcasts on Mr. Blue Dorn of Dominican Republic and Gulf and Western, and as I do more on John DeLorean, I've done some in the past, and Alfred Bueller, that these are the type of people that are the Odessa. If you want to recognize the Odessa network, you have to zoom in on these particular people. Now, Alfred Bueller is immune from any prosecution in the United States. He was involved in kidnapping in Africa. He, he took Mr. Shambe, and he was involved in the Congo and in Ghana. He works with Bell Helicopter. He has air fronts, the Page Aircraft. He's involved with money transfers through Lockheed, which is our major conduit of spy money. And with Boeing Aircraft, that's Senator Jackson from Seattle. He's the congressman from Boeing. This guy has an office in Liechtenstein with 30 people or more working for him. He has sent weapons to Morocco all over the world. He works tight connections to where the Vatican money is, the cities where the Vatican money is. He was in Chicago for a while. He said he got a law degree. He didn't. He was at the home base of Marcinkus. But he's worked for the CIA. I spent five hours Sunday, yesterday, afternoon, just outlining one article on Mr. Bueller. And I'll be referring to him, to Grumman Aircraft, to Page Airlines, to his work in Morocco and to Saudi Arabia, because he touches all the bases of the Nugenhan Bank of CIA kill money, narcotics, and guns, our, our admirals and generals, and so forth. But get the article if you don't have it. It's European Link to Illegal Acts Shielded by the CIA, and it's about Alfred Bueller, and it's written by Jeff Gerth. And as I say, anything that Jeff Gerth writes or Seymour Hirsch, take a double look and save it. Now, this evening on the news when I came in and earlier this week, they're asking for raising the bail of Mr. DeLorean. The March 29th San Francisco Examiner last week had a story, a laundry for DeLorean. Automotive News says the investigators believe there's 17 and a half million missing from DeLorean motor funds. It was diverted into bank accounts of unknown people, unknown people. The trade publication said the Swiss firm GPD Services was supposed to act as a middleman in the research and development of DeLorean sports car, but the money was created solely to launder cash. I told you the night he was arrested and he took Joseph Ball of the Warren Commission as attorney that he lost his virginity that night because that means CIA, Odessa, Ball was part of the Warren Commission and covered up the Nazi mob connections in killing John Kennedy. And uh, they all had a little in-joke about what they were to cover and not take as testimony because they did such a good, clean job of it. Now, DeLorean uh, visited daily Cardinal Cook in St. Patrick's in New York. He's a religious man. He's had a lot of different experiences, travels, and this dummy front, the secret to him, as I said before, is 
the bank accounts of the unknown people. Get a full listing of those, and I would venture, I'd make a wild guess, and I've said before, it's going to tie into NBC, to Johnny Carson, to the Belushi hit, etc., etc. This is a big story that they're wiggling around, but they're afraid to leave the country. I would if I were him, but <laughs> I don't think $10 million is much to get DeLorean out of town, but they're raising it to $10 million. Now, there's a story. I'm going to go to a story that is in Europe now about the Polish Pope and Mr. Brzezinski. We don't know if it's true or not. The news media is according, trying to say it's a forged document. But out of Europe, there is a document that's been printed saying how Brzezinski allegedly got a Polish Pope elected. And this is a document signed March 13, 1978, a memorandum from Zbigniew Brzezinski to President Carter detailing a plan on how they would destabilize Poland and how the, they would make the Soviets desperate because they, this top secret document was supposed to come from the National Security Advisor that the objective of the United States was to try and pull Poland out of the Soviet orbit and how Brzezinski would get a Polish pope in. The article says the sequence of events leading up to this, what they call a forgery, is a sophisticated job by the KGB that goes back five years and argues for the Reagan administration to expose and denounce this document. In October 1978, shortly after the election of John Paul II, the U.S. intelligence agents uncovered an undoubtedly authentic but wholly erroneous analysis portraying in elaborate detail how the United States was going to plot to make the Polish cardinal become the pope. They were going to uh, do this, and they did a good job. According to this analysis, Brzezinski, a native of Poland, and Cardinal John Kroll of Philadelphia, an ethnic Pole, were allegedly to have organized the American cardinals to vote in a block for this cardinal when the College of Cardinals met in the Vatican. Further, the Carter administration, with Brzezinski, was leading the way as portrayed as cultivating the West German Catholic leaders behind this present pope. The purpose, to back it up, was to get irritate the KGB and their chief, Yuri Andropov, and the Kremlin to set the stage for anti-Soviet revolt in Poland. Now, this document that's circulating around Europe is about how Brzezinski allegedly got this pope elected. Now, you take the overlay of what was happening when the John Paul I lived 30 days in the headlines in Europe that he was poisoned, and there were a lot of questions about who was with him, what he was reading, the stories of his death. There was no autopsy, the wine or the food he had, and there was a mass circulation of information that he had been killed, the 30-day pope. Then, lo and behold, in comes the Polish Pope. Now, Mr. Brzezinski and the Edwin Wilson, Frank Turpel, Korkula, uh, Thomas Kleins, our assassination teams that work very well and are synchronized, James Angleton and the whole gang have the technology to do this. They have the CIA right in the Vatican, and this has been explained over and over again, the role of the CIA right in the Vatican. I have many articles on it. Now, right now, the European press is saying it's not true, and Brzezinski is denying it. But this would be something that Mr. Andropov might have saved for the balance of power, because I always said that the balance of power is information. What you have on somebody will cause more peace than arming to the hilt, because you pull these things out, and it causes the other people who are involved to move back. And because so many denials are being proven to be true, you have to stave off your opinion. Did it work this way? Because certainly, as soon as this pope was in, there were mass demonstrations for him, microphones, filming, airplanes. He was set up in this country, traveled all over, and went to Poland, and there's been nothing but trouble. And, of course, there's been an investigation just going on this week on Lech Walesa. He allegedly got $50 million from this pope, and there was no solidarity in 1978. That all came in from AFL, CIO money, American unions, and the Vatican pouring money to get an uprising to force a reaction of the Soviet Union. And then we can arm to the teeth because we can say, being as they went into Poland and Afghanistan and don't have rights, therefore we can do so and so. But this is what's going on in Europe, and you have to watch it and Hold back your judgment, but I think it would be hard to pass something that important off as forged, and only time will tell. Now, the 
Russians and the Bulgarians are undercutting the case about the KGB trying to kill the Pope in 1981. The Los Angeles Times has a story. New documents undercut the case against the Bulgarian in a papal plot. Keep in mind Marvin Calvin, NBC, and all the money, the millions of dollars in this particular story. What they're saying is that Mr. Aja, AGCI, testified that he met with Mr. Antonov, A-N-T-O-N-O-V, and his wife, Rosica, R-O-S-S-I-T-Z-A, in Rome in the apartment on May the 10th when they discussed and planned the shooting of the Pope for May the 13th. Now it seems that this wife of Antonov's, her visit to Italy, her pass, expired on May the 11th, so she left the country a day early and was staying in Yugoslav in Trieste at a motel, and she wasn't in Italy at the time that Aja said he was with the two of them. Her residence slip was over. She left Italy on May the 8th because her residence permit was due to expire the next day, and she drove across the Italian border to Trieste, spent the night at a motel in Trieste in Yugoslavia. So she wasn't in Rome, and he said nothing about meeting these people until a year later, and they said, we'll give you a lighter sentence if you talk. So he began meeting with the CIA and came up with a story, and if he had just said he met Mr. Antonov, it would have been one thing, but he said he was with the two of them and one other person, and she wasn't even in the country. Another story in the San Jose Mercury, Bulgarians say the official is innocent in the Pope plot, and they are showing how that uh, Aja and the American news media have been lying about the story. The real story goes back again to the arms trafficking, which they're admitting that Aja did. It goes back to uh, an office in Milan that was raided. It, it was in November 27th, the end of the year this last year. A group called ARSAN, A-R-S-A-N, it's an international dope-dealing, gun-running operation run by the extreme right-wing and the Grey Wolf Nazi team that Aja belonged to from the very first stories. They're mafia gunmen, and it, it's located in the Banco Ambrosiano in Italy. That's the bank where Roberta Calvi was president and was murdered in London. We'll get into that story soon. The vice president of the bank was shot in the legs. He didn't die, but his legs were shot uh, the link of Aja to the, the narcotics traffic, the gun running, is more important. And also, the headquarters, one of the headquarters for this international group, are this uh, ARSAN, A-R-S-A-N. This is where they coordinated the deals. And the Stebaum, pardon me, is the organization. Henry ARSAN is the man. Stebaum, capital S-T-I-B-A-M, is the organization. And Henry Arsan is the gentleman in charge of it with an Italian wife, just as DeLorean is from Alsace, and he has the Italian wife. They have headquarters in Liechtenstein, and they work as a cover for Bell Helicopter, trading helicopters and tanks in the Middle East for heroin. Well, Alfred Bueller's headquarters are in Liechtenstein, and he is a cover or a front for sending Bell Helicopters out of Miami and around the world representing um, Bell Helicopter, and also it's Bell Helicopter where Walter Dornberger, the Nazi war criminal, worked in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and the host of Lee and Marina Oswald, Michael Payne, worked for Bell Helicopter. They were in the home of the family working for Bell Helicopter at the time of the Kennedy assassination. So Henry R. San worked in the Banco Ambrosioni, the organization. The front is called Steve Baum. This is supposed to be the largest uh, gun-running narcotics arrest in the history of Italy, the biggest arms trafficking of weapons and so forth. And this is where Mr. Aja will link into this gang. There's another article in New Solidarity, January 18th, 1983, on the terrorist organizations in Italy on Stepam, the organization in Milan located in the Banco Ambrosiano, the links to the Nazi International, to the drug mafia, the intelligence links, referred to as the Bulgarian Connection. And this article goes into Mr. Michael Ledeen. He's the one that works with Claire Sterling, who was located in Rome, who works with Lissio Jelly, who's now arrested. He's in, in Switzerland. Jelly is the head of the Masonic Lodge, the international fascist group that was down in Argentine. This particular article 
is about the links of the Bell Helicopter, of Michael and Dean, the Monte Carlo Lodge, the International Network, the murders, and the blowing up of the uh, the the tunnel there in um, Italy. The, there are so many people involved in blowing up that one tunnel that it seems it would take a whole army to that particular massacre. But Mr. Della Chase, C-H-I-A-I-E, you've heard his name, the soldier of fortune, works with these people. This is an article that I can outline for you involving the Bologna Tunnel, 1980, it blew up, 80 were dead. So far there's 80 people that have been apprehended that blew up 80 in the tunnel. I wonder what in the world was in that tunnel who was traveling there. But, the, again, overlapping the headquarters in Milan, in Liechtenstein, the Vatican gun running the mafia, the Bell helicopter. The Aja story is far from over, and the idea that the KGB did this, the longer it goes on, the sillier the Western world is going to be, and someday the responsibility is going to be placed just where it is into the fascist organizations known as the Odessa that have headquarters all over the world. It's important to uh, delineate some of these stories, but we're not getting much in the newspapers here. We're getting mostly out of the London Times, the London Observer, the Wall Street Journal, very few local newspapers like the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, very few articles coming out on this, but there's a mass of information being poured out in Europe, and once in a while we do get a story that the cover of a Jean who we met was a lie. When it floods out and they can't deny it any longer, they give us a few little crumbs. Now, this last week was also the anniversary of the shooting of Ronald Reagan that took place in March, at the end of March in 1981. He had just been in office a short time, a few months. And I won't do too much on that. I've done a lot on John Hinckley Jr. and Again, neo-Nazi headquarters in the United States, the Posse Comitatus, the links to the right wing, the immunity from arrest in Memphis, Tennessee, when he goes through the airport with weapons and so forth. But on the anniversary of the shooting, Ronald Reagan had some thoughts on this, and he said how he recalled his shooting. This is from the Washington Post. One of the things he said was interesting. He said, when it actually happened, I didn't even know I'd been shot in some, until somebody told me. I thought I would had broken a rib. Now that is very revealing what he said there because again there were more there was more than one gun and if you look at the way the wounds took place many of you saw the shooting on television or the reruns James Brady was shot in the head and he fell down and it looked like his brains were blown out I mean he just fell flat on the ground Secret Service agent Timothy McCarthy had dangerous wounds and fell again and the Washington, D.C. policeman Thomas Delahanty fell on the ground. And the three of them, Brady, Delahanty, and McCarthy, uh, were really hit bad. You could tell they were hit bad. And then the president, from a ricocheted bullet, uh, doesn't know he's shot, responds differently. He gets in the car. He allegedly, they're taking him to the White House, and then decide they'll take him to the hospital where he's supposedly walking in, and then they carried him in. And I'm not too good at ballistics, but it just seems to me that that would indicate a second gun if I ever saw one, because the, what hit him certainly was different than what hit the other men. It's interesting because if somebody really wanted to kill Ronald Reagan, it seems to me that uh, the shot would be the hardest to him and the lesser shots to the people on the street. But he didn't know, and he says he didn't know, and I believe it. And I often wondered... As he was walking to the car, he was waving and had his usual grin. Charles Spears, Spears calls him Smiley. He had his grin. But uh, as he gets into the car, there's this anguished look. And unless he was shot from the back, I wondered how he would get it. And I often wondered if the Secret Service man inside the car or close to him delivered it at that time just as he get in, got into the car because he just thought it was a rib and not a shot. And as I say, that there's something wrong with the way those bullets went. And in the continuing inquiry and also in Newsweek, I've mentioned this before, the April 13th, 1981 issue of Newsweek, you can see the picture of a person on the balcony that looks like he could be shooting, just like the Daltex building with the crossfire that killed John Kennedy. You can see that. And it looks like a man kneeling on the balcony. And several of the newswomen said at the time, they changed their story, that they heard a sound 
for coming over that wall at the Hilton Hotel would be very easy to do, or a different kind of bullet to make sure that he got it, the president got it, so that you didn't leave it to chance in case somebody put their hand in front of John Hinckley and the gun didn't go off. But uh, this picture is in Newsweek, April 13th, you can see it, and you see the man kneeling on the balcony. I won't say too much more about the Ronald Reagan shooting, maybe just one or two comments when we do the other side of this broadcast. We'll take a one-minute break and then continue on the second half of this broadcast this evening. Okay, now we're going to continue on side two. This is broadcast number 591, April the 4th, 1983, the 15th anniversary of the murder of Martin Luther King. Just one more moment about the uh, shooting of uh, Ronald Reagan. There was an article I got out of oh, it was the, thing, the Los Angeles Herald and Examiner, April the 10th, 1981. It was shortly after the shooting, a month later, about a man named Gordon McLendon, capital M-C, capital L-E-N-D-O-N, Gordon McLendon. The article is about from diamonds to metals, and it tells about he owns... Uh, 458 radio stations. It's called Liberty Broadcasting System. It says he's interested. He bought big league football, baseball players, professional players, boxers into his home. He is active in minerals and collecting minerals. He's a Texas multimillionaire. He pioneers in radio from rock and roll to modern good music. He has KABL in San Francisco and so forth. He's a major stockholder in Columbia Pictures. He's a very wealthy, mildly anti-communist, conservative stockholder in Columbia Pictures. And Columbia is where Jodie Foster made the movie Taxi that became the motive or the brainwashing symbol, symbol for John Hinckley. And I wonder how far back the extreme right plans operations to plant the seeds so that the cover story looks believable. Because there's a lot of people down there in Texas and elsewhere that think Ronald Reagan's just too liberal and they'd want to get someone farther right into the office, and, and uh, of course, Bush is from Texas and that part of the country and was director of the CIA. But it was interesting. This man collects, it says, from diamonds to metals, but he's the major stockholder in Columbia Pictures. And they it, this article just came out a month after the shooting, and that was that picture that was the motive for John Hinckley. Now to a grim subject that you may or may not have seen if your city, local cities doesn't have Jack Anderson, but I think this is one... If you don't have it, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, and I'll send you a copy of it. It's called Argentina's Grim Plan. I'm sure the people locally read our Monterey Herald, but these broadcasts go out all over, and you may not have Jack Anderson. Los Angeles doesn't have Jack Anderson, the city of three million. April the 1st, 1983, that was four days ago. Shortly before the Falklands War last year, Argentine government negotiated with a firm in Florida to build a $15 million crematorium in Buenos Aires. The purpose is to burn 400 people a day. The deposit was $50,000. Building a crematorium. Now, the Argentines said just this week to the British, we will return, we will take the Falklands. They're not through yet. They want to use the assembly line oven to cover up tortures, executions. They have thousands of victims in their dirty war against leftist guerrillas with suspected sympathizers and estimated 20,000 so far, 100 under the age of 10, have disappeared. This is about the automatic crematorium to have the capacity to dispose of 400 bodies every 24 hours made in the United States. An American company, leaving the American company, they had a $50,000 deposit. Be sure that Florida will continue to fund the crematorium and they will order it. Uh, it was to allegedly to rebury bodies in the city cemetery down there um, in Buenos Aires. They have a cemetery, and so that the people wouldn't have to touch the uh, cases where the bodies are, so that no human attendants would have to handle the remains. The Argentines insisted having a special device that would open caskets, dump the contents to a conveyor belt, feed them to the fur furnace. Now, Jack Anderson noticed that it's a Catholic country, and cremations are rare. I don't think they're running out of land in South America. And he says in the story in True, 
Gestapo fashion. And then he puts a dash KGB. But the Russians did not have crematoriums. Don't believe they did. He, he says, in true Gestapo fashion, victims were dragged from their homes in the middle of the night and hauled to military bases. Now, in the Soviet Union, people may have been taken out of their homes at night, but they didn't go from there into the oven. He says the lucky ones are killed outright. Most are interrogated under torture, beaten, raped, poked with electric cattle prods, immersed in tubs of filthy water. Fewer ever heard of God again. The Nazis were teaching the South Americans and are teaching them, and then our special forces are learning from them. They were set up by the Nazis, and we've been carrying this on the United States government. And the crematoriums would be delivered from uh, Florida and probably will. If they have the technology in order, then they'll go. Jack Anderson said the army, Anderson said the army used bulldozers to scoop out mass graves. They're unmarked, these huge graves, decomposing bodies. The Navy dumped victims, living or dead, from helicopters over the ocean. Remember again, William Colby, the director of our CIA, ran that program down in Southeast Asia called the Phoenix Program. When the human rights group complained about torture and this kind of behavior in Argentina, they responded and said, what were your statistics in Southeast Asia? What they didn't say, and I've said this on the air before, was that the Germans did it in Southeast Asia so the Germans wouldn't look guilty of doing it in Argentina. The Americans have bought it, set it up, and now want to deliver a crematorium down to Argentina. Can't they build their own? No, it has to come out of Florida. Is this part of the Odessa network? Is this part of the Ronald Reagan, Claude Kirk symbol? That they set up the Wagner Corporation, the security group that guard our airports. Remember when the Dallas Fort Worth airport was built, and I said it'd be used for huge transports to take mass population out of this country. Well, the crematoriums are going to be ready because Buenos Aires wants them. They talked about jokes about flying nuns throwing religious women. Uh, out of aeroplanes and so forth, and victims were tossed over the side of Navy vessels. One man, according to Jack Anderson, was, a, was diving under the water and saw dozens of weighted headless bodies. Well, I think it's interesting at this time that $15 million crematorium ordered from Miami, Florida, from Florida, and I'm uh, wondering, you know, Mr. Helms, Senator Helms, Jesse Helms, and a group of people in our Congress have refused to sign the genocide treaty. No genocide treaty. The United States is the only country that won't sign no genocide treaty. So isn't it natural that out of the United States comes the ovens? Now, Jack Anderson should ask or print the name of the company because we want to know if it's run by one of these guys from Vienna. Is it a corporation that Mr. Blue Dorn or Mr. Peter Drucker set up? What organization in Miami is making these things? What links to the Nazi Odessa, to Lysio Jelly from Argentine, to the Vatican, to I.G. Farben or Herman Abst, who became head of Hitler's banks and now is head of the Vatican Bank? Now, I think we could write letters to Mr. William Casey of the CIA, Mr. William Clark of the National Security Council, William Buckley in Washington, whose brothers have important positions in with Radio Free Europe and so forth, and Vernon Walters, our roving ambassador, because all of them are knighted members of Malta with an allegiance to the Vatican with direct links to the Nazis in Argentina. And let's find out who is running this country. If this isn't a warning, then forget it. I can't find anything more scary than that, and it's true in keeping to the kinds of things I've been trying to tell you for the past 11 years. Now, Jack Anderson had another story this week about Edwin Wilson. Wilson got some stiff sentences, and he's ready to sing a little bit or squeal about people in government that he worked for. Edwin Wilson was a paymaster for the Bay of Pigs. He goes back to the Kennedy assassination, goodness knows who, before the Trujillo or whatever. But after that, linked directly to the Nuganan Bank, to the Task Force 157, the Navy Intelligence, and the Yendi murder, the Letelier murder, and the the death squads that I was talking about a little earlier. Now, Wilson mentioned one person that he wants to squeal about. He, want, he says, according to Jack Anderson, that one congressman said Wilson has broadly hinted that he was responsible for the whole Che operation. This was referenced to the CIA-trained Cuban exile who killed in 1967 and helped the Bolivian troops 
track down and kill Che Guevara, G-U-E-V-A-R-A, Che Guevara. He was killed by the CIA, and Edwin Wilson later went on to work in Libya with Gaddafi, and Turple was arming Idi Amin and those death squads. But he had an ultra-secret CIA team, a team that went after Guevara and went after Kennedy and a lot of other people also, including Sadat, to make ready for Mubarak. He had a team that went after Guevara. Each team member wore a gold ring with Che engraved on the inside. And he's now saying he's squealing a little bit about the Sadat organization, the one that set up when Sadat was murdered, and I'll do more next week on that. But he talked about Che Guevara. Now, uh, one of the things that is important is the cruelty and the way these American-trained people go about and Che Guevara was trying to organize a labor movement against the death squads of Klaus Barbie, the butcher from Leon who was living in Bolivia and setting up death squads with the CIA to kill people like Che Guevara who would elevate the standard of living of the native population. There's a magazine similar to Soldier of Fortune called The Eagle, and in February 1983, just two months ago it came out, there was an article by Captain James Perry of the United States Army on how they killed Che Guevara, and he worked with Edwin Wilson. It says Che Guevara's last stand, and he says that there's a legend that five fingers, the article's called the five fingers of Che Guevara, that's there somewhere in the CIA in a pickling jar that the special forces, the United States Green Beret and the Bolivian Rangers uh, you know, the the Klaus Barbie team and our special forces did in Guevara and allegedly is a big joke that they cut off his fingers and they're in a bottle in uh, Washington, D.C. Now, a one particular person, a Mr. Prado, P-R-A-D-O, was uh, the one who captured Che Guevara and this article tells about the killing and how they identified him and called into the main station, which is like the CIA station we have, Papa, and he had serious leg wounds. They had to carry him to a little schoolhouse, and they kept him there one day, and then they told him they were going to shoot him, and they propped him against the wall, and Che, you know, told the fellow where to shoot, and he shot him once in the chest. And then the uh, trained men of our Central Intelligence Agency and Green Beret went one by one, this is the story, eight non-commissioned officers stepped forward, each pumping a single round in Guevara's chest, cursing him as they did it, and Che was already dead, but they mutilated him and then went back where Che's co-workers were and executed a guy named Willie and another gorilla. Then they dynamited the schoolhouse, and then they doused the bodies with gasoline and burned them, and then flew Che's body and photographed it to prove the great thing that they did. Uh, a little sickening tonight, but <laughs> the news is sickening, and I'll tell you, there has to be some end to these death squads while we fight nuclear bombs because these people have their hands on the bomb. Don't think for a minute that what I'm talking about is separated from the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. They were made by the same Nazis that trained these torturers. They are made for mass populations to drop on them, and they really don't give a darn. They don't care what they do, and that's the truth. And, and so that the weapons are in the hands of these crazies and if you don't stop the individual murders like John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Che Guevara, and the various people working their way up, writers or civil rights leaders or professors, somebody who knows about these things, if you don't stop that, all you're left with is the crazies. And according to Wall Street Journal and London Times this last week, the articles, this death squad have killed up to 2 million people. 2 million have been killed that were part of the squad. Incidentally, in uh, one of these magazines, like the, it's on the uh, How to Kill the Special Forces and the Green Beret a magazine called Gung Ho, March 1983, they have an article on ways that the Special Forces and the Green Beret kill and how they follow and trap and how to be alert and uh, how to get the person you're after. And then an important part of Gung Ho, the instruction is, leave no trace of your passing. It is impossible to move anywhere without leaving some trace, such as a displaced leaf or footprint. It's imperceptible to human sense or traces. However, these traces can be found. 
and you have to be careful to have no clue or key for your adversary, the enemy's ability to interpret where you are and get rid of pieces of information for future trackers and so forth, or dogs or electronic equipment. And this is how to make yourself lose your clues. Now, when Kevin McCullough blew the whistle on Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple for five years to tell how we were sending, the United States CIA was sending weapons of torture of uh, schools over in the Middle East on how to bomb, how to kill, how to blow up briefcases, how to stab, sending the equipment for huge transports over to these places for Gaddafi and for Idi Amin and for anyone else who wants them around the world. He blew the whistle. He didn't want to be involved in this, and it took five years for a trial to begin. And once the trial began and Edwin Wilson was to be tried, one week before the trial begins, the whistleblower is murdered. It's some strange little offbeat cabin out in the country where if a trial is to begin in Houston, he would have protection under the protection system of the federal government. If you're naming somebody and identifying them, you have protection. He's off alone with some people and women, and the guy is done in. Now, we get to another one. (laughs) Should have done some more on John Lennon tonight, but I wanted to update you on some of these stories because they are pertinent and because Wilson is bragging about killing Che Guevara and at the same time the CIA, the special forces, are bragging about how they did it and they worked with him. And at the same time, Klaus Barbie is arrested and he headed the Bolivian police team that worked with our CIA. So while Barbie is in France arrested, Wilson, Edwin Wilson is arrested. They both worked in Bolivia, and now Wilson is squealing his little piece of that story. Now, the London examiners and so forth have had to come out and order a new probe on the death of Roberta Calvi. He was president of the largest bank in Italy. It'd be like being the president of Bank of America. The original story was that he was hung off of this bridge, the Blackfriars Bridge, and put some rocks in his pocket and hung himself after leaving a hotel and walking several miles. Now the British court has overturned the verdict that he committed suicide, and they've ordered a new inquest, and they said that he was murdered. Now, there was a marvelous TV show Jessica Savage had and names people that were with him up to the end. I never saw such a good TV melodrama, true life story, with these people, and I did a broadcast on it, and you can send for those tapes. I have the transcript of that broadcast with direct links of these particular characters that goes to Paul Marcinkus in the Vatican because Calvi was investing millions of dollars of Vatican money, $1.2 billion, that's more than millions, and he had a string of multi-million dollar frauds that rocked the financial world. Now, he was involved with the Vatican. He was involved with the Bank of Italy. He had smuggled... 20 million out of Italy, and goodness knows, like DeLorean, where the 17 million is in the Swiss bank. These guys are working with hundreds of millions of dollars, 50 smuggles here, 20 here, and so forth. But the obvious story about his suicide was so far fetched, the people he's with, the way he was cornered. The problem is that, that they changed it because of new evidence to a murder. The question is, why did the coroner in London? say it was suicide. How many suicides are really murder? We know. I talk about them all the time and share them with you. And then years later, maybe a month later, a year later, 10 years later, you find out they were outright murders. People like Marilyn Monroe that's supposed to commit suicide, they end up with a needle in their heart and in their arm. You find, if I talk about something on the air with you, it's because That case will never be solved until all the truths are out. I don't just mention people that passed away like Grace Kelly and try to stir up a murder story or John Paul I. When I share information with you, it's based on a lot of articles, a lot of contacts of the person who was slain, and a lot of information from an accumulated mass of books and articles that are sent to me by people all over. And the London coroner had to have the story that it was a suicide. How many other suicides has he covered? And what pressure was there by the Vatican or London or the Queen or Margaret Thatcher or the Masonic Lodge to lie the first time? Uh, You could see why they were doing it in Italy, but the Masonic Lodge has a lot of big headquarters over in London, and he was very much involved over in London also. 
You see, the secret Masonic lodge, the Odessa, with its tentacles in Monte Carlo, where Grace had her demise right on the road on the way from France to Monte Carlo, London, Monte Carlo, Argentine, Buenos Aires, Zurich, and the international banks in Liechtenstein are all tangled together in this mess. And the rich and poor, as the article in Death Squads said, the rich and poor get it equally. There's many millionaires being offed as there are just peasants, not as many that they take masses of peasants, but there are a lot of millionaires. I keep one file on the millionaires that are off because they are part of the saga and they can't afford to have them alive anymore. And what makes these guys such millionaires? Uh, several weeks ago, and oh, every once in a while, I talk about the funding of the Nazi money and how it's distributed and how it was taken out of Europe, out of the various countries, put in Swiss banks, South America, and elsewhere. And then was released when the Nazis got out of prison to begin businesses and corporations. Well, New Solidarity had an article about Otto Skorzeny's widow. He was the one that worked with I.G. Farben and Martin Borman, who could travel back and forth to these various countries and walked out of an American prison. And Otto Skorzeny died a few years ago. But would you know, his widow is still in dishing out the money and this article in New Solidarity, they referred to it as uh, Madame Scorzeni, the whore of Babylon, this article. And it says, a key figure involved with Swiss bankers and capital flight operations to destroy the third world is Madame Scorzeni, a former resident of Zurich, Switzerland, who still lives on the island of Majorca. She has money going in and out of Mexico, the United States, and Liechtenstein, and this article says, who is the whore of Babylon? She's the widow of Otto Scarve Scarface Scorzeni, Hitler's special operation expert, whose spider web, D Spine, that's small D-I-E, capital S-P-I-N-N-E, that's the Odessa, the spider web. Uh, she has a network, and she smuggled money, you know, from Spain. Rather than being hanged at Nuremberg, her dear husband went all over from the Mediterranean, South Africa, into uh, all over the world. He's Asia. He's traveled everywhere distributing this money to put the Nazis back in business. And this article says, Madame Skorzeny is also the niece of Hitler's economic minister, Hallmar Schacht, S-C-H-A-C-H-T. But I thought that Skorzeny was the son-in-law of Hallmar Schacht. I think she's the daughter, which makes it even worse, the daughter of Hitler's banker, Hallmar Schacht. When he was released by John J. McCloy, uh, Schock went to the uh, vote of Aristotle Onassis and began his career, and the money, the dope dealing, and the uh, swindling was going back and forth from uh, Monte Carlo to Argentina and all over the world, shocked and, and Churchill and the international jet set on the yacht of Aristotle Onassis. Well, it seems old money bags is still working. According to this article, Mrs. Scorzeni, uh, has interest, particularly in Morocco. Morocco is one of the places where Mr. Alfred Bueller is interested, I, that I mentioned earlier in the program. And Vernon Walters of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, the fellow who works with Ronald Reagan as a roving ambassador and ambassador, uh, not official, but representative to the government of Morocco. Uh, he worked with top Nazis, Mr. Contreras and other Nazis involved in the murder of Salvador Allende and Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C. She works out of Morocco and Madrid. You think that these Nazis have died off. You can sleep at night. The old war is over. Let's go on with the new. What a lot of people don't know, and it's very important to understand that a lot of them didn't die. And as you see with the Claus Barbie story, and now there are new stories coming out about other people like him linked to the American intelligence system. They never gave up their project to keep the Thousand Year Reich going. The only thing we did as a people is when World War I was over, say that's the end of wars, we'll have peace. World War II was over, the war, war to end all wars. Vietnam was over, go back and do your macrame and bake your bread and you're, get into yourself, the great self-centered generation of trying to analyze what's comfortable for me. You know, is it going to be hot tubs or disco dancing? And what the people don't understand is that, that the thousand year right never stopped. We stop. We get turned off. We choose. You can watch the Academy Awards soon. I mean, do you really care who wins that night or could you go get a book? 
And speaking of books, uh, I don't want to get too far off the subject, but it's very important. There are lots of good books that I use detailing these stories. And there are book sales in the spring and fall and in your local towns, whether you're back east or in Long Beach. There's one here in our own area, the Selena Li Selena's Library. The Monterey County Library is having a sale this next week, Friday and Saturday of this week, rather, a few days away. And that's where I get my books. That's where we researchers get them. I get reference books for 25 cents. Next day, they're half price. And I fill up the car station wagon with new books, biographies of these people, books on the Kennedy assassination, the Warren Report, there's books on the murder of Martin Luther King and a mind control, the government CIA operations, the Pentagon, the statistics of weapons. You can collect these and go to these library sales all over the country and go early, be the first one in line and get the books and put them away. Paperbacks sometimes are two for a quarter. You get The Secret Team by Fletcher Prouty and, and I can't even list, I could list for an hour for you the books that I got at book sales just this month and tell you the titles. It's a marvelous way to collect a library and sit and read that stuff and get off of the commercial slick business that constantly titillates you. And then tomorrow you can't remember what it was about. It's El Junco. Read a good book and turn on KAZU if you live in this area and listen to the music. I do it more. I've just gotten so I listen to this station and don't even turn on the other stations anymore. And when I read and study and get rid of the junk. And when you get rid of that, you'll read about Otto Skorzeny in every single history book of World War II and his notorious work with Adolf Hitler so that when you read a newspaper article about Madame Skorzeny, the horror of Babylon, you know who she is and how she's still distributing his money and where she's working. And this article says that she was linked, as was her husband, with Mr. Claus Barbie, with Americans leading citizens, including Henry Kissinger, who was our Secretary of State, the head of our National Security Council, and former CIA Director and OSS Station Chief Alan Dulles. And when Dulles died, William Casey took over and is CIA Director now. And she worked with the British and um, all the intelligence agencies of the Western world to get the money out of Europe to start their wonderful double life. Well, I think we've done a lot of grisly stories. I was going to do a little bit more on Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, but I think I'll put that off until next week. I just want to mention again before I close the story from London Times and the Wall Street Journal, two million people, re people reported executed summarily in the last 15 years. Remember, in 1972, I was going to write a book, Murderville, USA, but there's so many deaths, I don't have time to write it. Now it's supported by these studies. It says at least 2 million people in the world were executed arbitrarily, rich and poor, urban workers, professional people, religious groups, ethnic people, because somebody wanted them done in. The government has information that there was no due process of law in the last 15 years or so. It has been pra practiced in many countries. It is a consistent pattern of death squads. Now, I've been saving articles on professors in this country, civil rights workers, 40 or 45 rock musicians, now the punk rocker being killed. Uh, there are categories of scientists, professors, people running for office, opponents for people who would run or split the vote, who were shot at, candidates, Democratic candidates for sure. You know, after John Kennedy was murdered. His brother, Senator Robert Kennedy, was murdered. Mary Jo Kopechny was murdered, so Ted Kennedy could never become president. You got rid of the three of them with three deaths, shooting George Wallace and two attempts on Gerald Ford that didn't happen but would have cleared for Reagan much easier. Well, the death squads are there. That's what we talk about. We'll end now with a happy thought. Let's think of one happy thing for one minute or one second before the next program begins. Well, we're alive and we're free, and that's happy. So use your health and use your freedom and do something with it while you can. That's that's the best thing I can say. And meanwhile, this is Mae Brussel, and it's KAZUFM in Pacific Grove, California.